turtles, all sorts of animals moving. So I can guarantee your elbows and your fossil hall are establish a new level of accuracy. You have great elbows. <laughs> great elbows. Um, and the Black Hills Institute, who is not represented here except by me, a longtime friend, they're superb. There's nobody better. Absolutely nobody better. Very few equal. And uh, your mounts, cast and real bones, are the most graceful of any major museum, well, any museum, because of all the loving scrutiny done to every joint. It's just wonderful. Now, why, when I said uh, thumbs and big toes, did I say, except for duck-billed dinosaurs? You know this. This is a duck-billed dinosaur hitchhiking. <laughs> this is a duck-billed dinosaur, two thumbs up. <laughs> duck-billed dinosaurs have no thumbs. They're the only dinosaurs that have no thumbs. T-Rex has a thumb. It's small, but it's got a thumb. Why do duck-billed dinosaurs not have thumbs? Triceratops has a big thumb. Diplodocus has a huge thumb. The raptors have very long thumbs. Why do duck-billed dinosaurs have no thumbs? You know this. And that's not an explanation. That's a teleological explanation. Who are the ancestors of duck-bills? Very famous dinosaur. Found in England. You don't want to play volleyball with them. When they spike the ball, the ball, they spike the ball. Iguanodon. Iguanodon. I can tell there are very few kids in this audience. <laughs> the level of DQ, dinosaur uh, intellectual quotient is way the heck down. A uh, duckbill dinosaurs have a thumb modified into a spike of bone, which was covered with a spike of fingernail, so it's a deadly in close weapon. Duckbills gave up that weapon. And the thumb was so specialized, it couldn't do anything else. So it was gone. That's why this is, this is a duckbill. Three pink, everyone do this, please. You will remember it like this. And this is an iguanodon, the ancestor of duckbills. And to make a duckbill, just remove the thumb. That happens to some in the Japanese mafia, but that's another whole thing. <laughs> that's another whole thing. Okay, the answer, there will be one secret question. The answer is, Hemisalodon may have been the big cat at the Eocene, Oligocene boundary. Or just Hemisalodon. Anyone know what Hemisalodon is? Anybody? Half a Saladon. Half a Saladon, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a hard room. <laughs> All right, someone's supposed to introduce me now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's fun? Sometimes I always get in early for a lecture, and there's always people, a few people coming in. And if we see them, I say, let's do a Q&A and pretend that this is the end of the lecture, and everyone else coming in has the time wrong. <laughs> that really works. <laughs> Diplodocus, unless you say it's Diplodocus, and it'll tell me to say, no, it's Diplodocus. <laughs> you don't want to go. Anyway, there are things kids don't know, and they don't know about Hemisaladon, the half of Saladon. It's a huge predatory mammal, a head about this big, really big. Uh, combination giant jaguar in shape and a Tasmanian devil. It's a seriously big, scary predator, restricted to a thin twilight zone at the end of the Eocene epoch which is about um, 40 million years ago. It's found everywhere in North America in this thin twilight zone. It was, it was the apex predator. We know so very little about it, Hemisaladon. Was it a running predator like a giant wolf? Was it an ambush predator like a um, lion? There is a bone which suggests Hemisaladon, the twilight predator. I like that twilight predator. We can market that, write that down. Uh, is anyone writing anything down? <laughs> Up here digitally, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, I've noticed, speaking about, well, we'll get to zombies in a little bit. Um, I'm puzzled about the theology of zombies, because in The Night of the Living Dead, the first movie, 
If you're bitten by a zombie, it hurt, but you didn't turn into a zombie. But the remake, if you're bitten by a zombie, in a couple hours you become a zombie. And then the wonderful scholarly treatment called Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> if your mom is bitten by a zombie, you've got to shoot her in the head with a shotgun because she will become a zombie. But isn't that vampire lore? If you're bitten by a vampire, you become a vampire? Am I correct? I'm confused. But anyway, Hemisaladon is this mystery twilight predator. And there's one ankle bone suggesting it was very flat-footed, kind of like a bear, a combination bear and lion with a giant head. Um, there's a very similar one in Africa and Asia later, much later, but not in North America, the mystery twilight predator. I like that. Um, in, your, in your joy of being your class, and I mean the class mammalia, there's lots of loose talk about class warfare among various people, um, buying time on TV. Nonsense. I'm going to talk about the real class warfare. We are all class mammalia, with the exception of the guy in the third row from the back over there. <laughs> you are all furry, to an extent or another, hairy, warm-blooded, big hearts, big lungs, various extents. And um, you also represent what philosophers call the highest rung of evolution. And that's interesting. Here's a question, one last question for you. Does evolution make you, an evolving group, more efficient? What have you heard? Are you more efficient than your ancestor, Lucy? Seven million years, are you more efficient? Efficient in doing what? Exactly what? Yeah, and she wouldn't waste time playing Angry Birds, though. One simple, there's the rear end of a guy. Um, anyway, <laughs> the reigning hypothesis was that all of these remains of tropical animals, including the hyenas, were washed into this hole. And Buckland said, wait a minute, what's the evidence on the ground? He's the original paleocea side. What's the evidence on the ground? The evidence says the bones were chewed, fractured, hardly a bone was whole, including bones from big rhinos. They were chewed at both ends. How could that happen in a foot? Uh, unlikely. And this is another piece of evidence you saw. With the chewed up bones, there were white lumps, just like this. This is from a modern day hyena lair in Africa. This is what Buckland saw, white lumps. He touched them, they were dry lumps. He had them analyzed chemically. They were calcium phosphate, which is bone meal. This is the type of stuff that was being imported to make uh, bone china, Chinese fashion, all the rage in England. So he had these rounded lumps of bone meal with chewed up bones and hyena remains. Ah, if only William Buckland in 1820 had a pet hyena that he could experiment with and see how it processed bone. If I got me had a pet hyena at home called Billy, Billy the hyena. Uh, Billy was sent to the Reverend Buckland to dissect. And the Reverend Buckland looked at those big eyes and said, I can't cut him open. He became a pet at a run of the rectory. And um, Buckland, having found the lumps, immediately instructed the keeper of Billy, feed Billy ox bones. And he did. And he instructed the keeper to, to say, when Billy begins to hunch over, about to take a dump, tell me. Very important, tell me. And, and one day, uh, the, the runner came to the Oxford and said, Reverend Buckland, Reverend Buckland, it's happening. And Buckland left and went to the pen, and Billy took a dump. And, and the Reverend Buckland reached out and he had in his hands a perfect replica of those round calcium phosphate lumps that was found in fossil form in the cave. You know, here was an experiment, 1820 experiment. It was warm and remarkably free of odor. Hyena shit is remarkably uh, odoriferous. Anyway, that was the first CSI careful analysis of a den of predators ever done. And the evidence was the cracked bones, splintered bones, the thorough destruction of the prey, the presence of hyenas, adults and juveniles, and the apostory evidence of the hyena lobs. It's very cool, very cool. You want a medal for that. Anyway, this is my interpretation of how the English, I say more dirt-like stabbing tooth, Hoplophonia is a bigger one, and you smile is a very wide sword-like one. These all live together, it's an incredible diversity in the um, Oligocene epoch about 35 million years ago, this third wave, it's way cool. Here's one, Oplophonius, 
We know it attacked Oreodon, a plant eater, living in burrows. We've actually found the Oreodons in burrows with its young. There is a specimen out there in your hall of this plant eater found in a burrow with her young. And it's a beautiful skeleton of this false cat. We call it a fusion. It can be excavated by the next wave of stream deposition and reworked. In Montana, we know that happened to thousands of small mammals in the Blood Creek anthills. Um, and shed teeth, duck goes shed their teeth very rapidly as they fed. And in channel deposits where duck goes were living in and around, you usually find hundreds or even thousands of shed teeth. Are no shed teeth there? I don't think so. There's no reason a priori to believe that somewhere dinosaurs survived a little longer. We know woolly mammoths survived in North Islands, north of Siberia, thousands of years after they disappeared on the continents. So it could have happened, probably did happen, but not there. Yeah. Yes. One branch evolved into whales. We now know that's not true. Whales came from an artiodactyl, something like a uh, distant relative of a hippo. Oh. And that's the case. Uh, then how come the Messiah kids had, had a longer run compared to Hyenodons, which had more effective teeth? That's an interesting question. It took a while. The hyenodon probably evolved in Africa, it was exported from Africa, and hit North America at the end of the AC in about 38 million. The hyenodons, with these extremely efficient self sharpening teeth, did coexist with the last mesonychids with their very blunt teeth for a short time, but it was a very short time, after which all the mesonychids are dead and you've got a variety of hyenodons, which then proceeded to last another 18 million years in North America, Africa, and Eurasia. One of the biggest mammal predators of all time, the Gistotherium, has a head about that big. It is a hyenodon. It's got a head that big. And probably weighs more than a big grizzly bear pushing a ton. And there's another one, Hyenolorus. So hyenodons, they won a long period of success as top predators. Part of the reason, most likely, is their extremely efficient way of flensing a carcass. Why the Mesonychids lasted so long with their rather blunt teeth, I don't know. I don't know. That are much more complete, like the Delphin, so called possum. No, 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 no,